Let's pray together. Beautiful Savior, Son of Man, the one who will come to sit forever on the throne of God Most High, who has earned that place through your righteous suffering and glorious resurrection. Son of Man, we worship you. Jesus, we thank you for what you've done for us, and we ask that you would turn our hearts towards you. Would you lift our gaze to your presence now, God? Would you inspire us through the teaching of your word? And I do pray that the teaching and preaching of your word this morning really would be your words of life to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> It's good to be back with you. I got a few emails from folks saying, hey, where'd you go? We were concerned, and I've learned a lesson over the years to never tell anyone when I'm going on vacation because no one comes to church if I announce my departure, but no one's coming to church anyway, so I guess I probably should have told you. <laughs> when I'm back, we were in uh, North Carolina and West Virginia for a few weeks, and we had a wonderful time except for one day. It was a disastrous day. My son Luke and I were mountain biking down a, a very long and dangerous downhill, and he got all the way to the bottom, and he was standing in a river just basking in the glory of his success, and he slipped and busted his front tooth out right in the river. Yeah, it was like the worst. It went from the best day to the worst day in, instantly. And so Mom and I are in panic mode, right, and we're trying to find an emergency dentist, and I'm driving probably quicker than I should, and I stopped too fast, and somebody rear-ended us on the way to the dentist. And I'm like, awesome. This is just getting better. I'm like looking up for the meteorite to come streaking across the sky and land on our car or something. But, uh, hey, if that's as bad as it gets, it could be worse. It's all good. But it is great to be back with you this morning. I really have uh, missed you all and longed to be with you, and that, that tells me surely that I'm in the right place. Man, I love what God's doing in this church. Yeah. Don't you love what God's doing in this church? Something's happening here. We'll see more of it. In Jesus' name. All right. If you got your Bibles, we're, uh, we're going to be in Romans chapter 12 this morning. We're finishing up a summer teaching series on the book of Romans been in this book for over two months now, and this is, this is the last week that you'll have to endure me speaking on the book of Romans, so if you haven't been paying attention, now's your chance to get the point here. Um, the, t the title of this sermon series is Grace Changes Everything. That really is one of the main messages of this book. Grace, and let me define the term, God's grace means his un- merited, unearned favor towards you, and that primarily has nothing to do with you. It has to do with the person and work of Jesus Christ, the one who did for you what you could not and cannot do for yourself. God's faithfulness towards you, his goodness towards you, is a mark and stamp of his faithfulness and goodness, not yours. That's great. Thank goodness. Amen. Amen. That's God's grace. And that has the possibility to radically change everything about you as it begins to invade your heart. And here's what I want to say to you this morning. God's grace, his unearned favor towards you in Christ Jesus will change everything about you as, this is what I want to say, you take it in more regularly than CNN. God's grace will change everything about you as you give it more time in your life than Fox News. God's Radical goodness and favor towards you in and through the person of Jesus Christ will totally transform everything about you as you become concerned with it 
more than you are concerned with who gets elected in November. And I'm not saying those things aren't important. Don't hear me say that. I'm not saying it's unimportant who gets elected in November. And I'm not saying there aren't important things that come to us in the news. I'm simply encouraging you to daily and regularly consider something that is far more important. The person and work of Jesus Christ. And if you don't daily and regularly let that truth and reality invade your heart, then it won't make it down to your hands and your feet. And you will not walk in the abundance of life that God has fully laid out for you through what He started in you through His grace. I'm, that's all I want to say. Somebody's like, well then sit down. We've heard enough from you. All right, well then let's hear from Scripture. Turn with me to Romans. If you got your bulletins, we're going to be in the very first verse of this passage from Romans this morning. And I'm not going to get beyond it. This, is, this one verse is so loaded that it deserves hours, not just minutes. If you got your Bibles, it's chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be genuine. Look at this. Hate what is evil. Anyone know anything about evil? We're daily immersed in it. And I want to talk about that for a minute. How are we daily immersed in evil? Well, I'm going to get there. But first, I want to think about this next line. And hold fast to what is good. Well, I want to ask you this question. What does it mean to hold fast to what is good? Or, or maybe back up from that and think about this. What really is good? And, and if, if you know Paul's line of argument in the book of Romans, you know that he's just spent 12, no sorry, 11 chapters unpacking something that is so radically and gloriously good that it should change everything about you. And ready, here it is. It's the grace of God in the person of Jesus Christ. When I hear this statement, hate what is evil, turn away from it, and love what is good, and consider what is good, and, and, and let this goodness invade who you are, I think, well, what goodness is he talking about? And surely, contextually, he is talking about the goodness of the grace of Almighty God. And I'm going to prove it to you. If you know anything about the way Paul writes his letters, he writes them from theology to application. He does this in all of his letters. He starts, well, all except for Corinthians. Anyhow, he... He starts by telling you what you should know about what God's done for you. Theos, theology, study of God, okay? And in Romans, it's 11 chapters of that. And then there's a very clear break where Paul usually says, therefore, in light of everything that I've just told you about theos, about God, here's what you should do with it. Here's how you apply this to your life. There's a very clear break in almost all of his letters from theology to application. And the break in Romans is in 12 verse 1. If you've got your Bibles, just look there. This is very typically Pauline language. 12 verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore. Well, we should learn to ask the question, what's the therefore, therefore? The, that therefore is an intentional throwback to everything he's just said. And, and if you didn't read verses, chapters 1 through 11, Paul sums it up in one beautiful little phrase. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Okay, so he's going somewhere, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, but he says, look, I know you can't do that. You won't do that, and you can't do that unless your heart is first invaded by the radically good mercies of God in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the thing that's going to motivate you to live in a radically different way. So, I'll just take a few minutes to do the Cliff Notes version of the last two months of what we've seen in the book of Romans. Listen to some of this goodness when Paul says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. 
therefore by the mercies of God. Here are his mercies. Listen to this, chapter 5, verse 1. Paul says this, Therefore, since we are justified, which means legally declared innocent in a courtroom of God's grace, God is now standing in front of you as the judge of the universe. This is good news for somebody, and it'll set your heart free if you'll pay attention. He's got the gavel in his hand, and he is justly able to accuse you of sin and condemn you to death. And instead, through his goodness and grace, he justifies you, which means he brings the gavel down in the courtroom of Almighty God, and he legally pronounces you innocent as though you've never sinned. Well, that's not true about you. But it is in the person of Jesus. Because as a gift, you wear his very righteousness. Well, that's what's wrapped up in this verse. Chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we are legally justified, declared innocent by God through faith, listen to this, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. And I guarantee you there's someone who walked in these doors this morning wondering whether you got peace with Almighty God. I guarantee you there's somebody watching this morning wondering, and it's ba- you're evaluating the question based on how you've lived with the three to five things you happen to care about this week. Well, guess what? God sees them all, not just the ones you care about right now. And you're asking, well, does, how does God feel about me now? Well, here it is. If you've placed your faith in the person of Jesus Christ, he is absolutely, radically, and hilariously in love with you, and he has declared you innocent through paying the penalty and price for your sin in his own body. Don't punish him again. Through wallowing and shame and guilt, he's removed your shame. That's good. That's that's good. When Paul says in chapter 12, verse 9, hate what is evil. I'm in chapter 9, here we go. And hold fast to what is good. That's good. Let me just give, give you one more. Chapter 5, verse 6, Paul says this. While we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will someone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might dare to die. Listen to this. God proves his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, well, let me tell you why that's good. Because there's a whole bunch of us, myself included, who, who look at ourselves in the mirror and think, God, how could you possibly love me now? And again, and we evaluate that based on however we're doing with the three to five things we happen to be caring about at that moment. And here's God's answer from Romans 5. Let me tell you how I love you now. Because I loved you then, doofus. It's a biblical word. Let me tell you why I can love you now, even though you're, you have this... this affinity for that thing that's destructive. I love you now because I loved you when you didn't care at all. (laughs) Let me read it to you again. God proves his love for us in that yet while we were still sinners, Christ died. Jesus lavishes his grace on you when you didn't give a rip about him. And now you give a little eensy teensy rip. Well, that's better than where you were. And, and, and from that place we think, oh God, how could you possibly love me now? Because he loved you then, when you were his enemy. That's what's wrapped up in chapter 12, verse 9. Paul says, Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. So I'm not done. I know I'm used to praying at the end, but I'm going to pray right now, and I want you to pray with me, and then I'm going to keep preaching, all right? Lord, would you allow us to more fully embrace what is good? And it's your gospel, God. It is the grace 
in and through the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's the peace that we have with you through Jesus. It is the justification, the being declared not guilty that we have through Christ that is good. Lord, would that invade our hearts more than it has before. I pray that you'd release somebody from guilt and shame this morning. That you'd usher someone into freedom through the gospel of grace this morning. Amen. Okay, I'm going to keep going. This is sermon number two. I'll look at the first part of this verse. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Love, let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Talk about that for a minute. What does that mean? To hate what is evil. This is probably going to be a challenge for someone. I just want you to know it's a challenge for myself. I want to talk about the news for a minute. I'm talking about the news media. It comes out of that square box in our living rooms. It's on more than it should. And particularly, I want to talk about the never-ending cycle of bad news that we put ourselves in front of for hours a day. Paul says, hey, I want you to hate what is evil. And here's what I want to say to you in no uncertain terms. There is a lot of evil that comes out of that square box in your living room. And, and we, we, we allow it, but we, we intentionally turn it on and allow that stuff to invade our homes, invade our minds, invade our days. We meditate on it, and at the same time, we stand back and go, now that's awful, now you shouldn't do that. I hate that. I hate that behavior. Well, here's what I really want to say to you. Do you really? Do you really hate that behavior? And is your curious affinity for it maybe a symptom of some misplaced love for that stuff? You can't seem to do without it. Is that really hate? Or is it a misplaced affection? We were watching the news yesterday. We've been camping for three weeks, right? No news. It was awesome. Guess what? The world's still just as bad as it was when I left. None of this stuff's been worked out, even though I wasn't aware of it. And, and we turned on the news yesterday, and Jerry Falwell Jr.'s on the news. All right? Now, I can't even talk about what's going on with this guy because it's X-rated, and this is Sunday morning. But Jerry Falwell Jr.'s gotten in big trouble because of some behavior that he and his wife were wrapped up in, and it's being so vividly described on the news that my kids are in a room, and it it gets so X-rated that I have to turn it off. Evil is what it is, and I intentionally let it come into my house. And and interestingly, my brilliant 11-year-old daughter, when I did turn it off, she says, Dad, that's not even news. It's gossip. <laughs> and I thought, dang, you're right. What the heck is newsworthy about some guy's troubled family matters? Why does that need to come into my living room at 5 o'clock on Saturday night? It's gossip and it's evil. It's impossible to watch the news without a story of murder. That's evil. And my question for you is, I think all of us who stand back and watch the news media would, would hear the, the latest story of murder, either locally or nationally, and, and with our arms crossed say, that's evil, you shouldn't do that. And I hate that. Well, do you really hate it if you let it so regularly invade your heart and mind? And would it possibly be a more appropriate reaction to say, you know what, today I'm not letting that stuff in. If you begin begin and end your day 
with a regular consumption and meditation on the worst parts of our culture, can you say that you truly hate those things? I don't think you can. I've been reading a book with a few men from our church, and it's been really enlightening. It's a book called You Are What You Love by James K.A. Smith. He's a contemporary Christian philosopher. And he talks in his book about the powerful influence of habit. Okay, here's what he says. That your habits reveal your loves. It's a quote from the book. Your habits reveal your love. Your deepest desire is the one that is manifested in your daily life and habits. If, if your day begins and ends with the obnoxious and largely evil news media cycle, that's the thing you love. And your habits reveal it. This is another quote from the book. To be human is to be a lover. Your heart was made by a God who says that person's made to be a lover. The question is, what are you going to love? And your daily rituals and routines, ready? They both inform your loves and create them. Your, whatever your habits are, they tell you what you love. They inform them. Okay, that's what I love because that's what I do all the time. But it also creates your loves. Those habits don't just reflect who you are. They help you become what you're becoming. Yeah. All right, look at chapter 12. And I'm almost done. Look, verse 14. Look at this. This is so fascinating. Chapter 12, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. And here's what I'm going to say to you. If you have a daily habit of watching people on TV curse those who curse them, angrily mistreat those who angrily mistreat them, how on earth are you going to expect yourself to do anything other? All right, in the book, You Are What You Love, James Smith quotes Timothy Wilson. This is really good. Timothy Wilson, <clears throat> a UVA psychologist and from my wife's alma mater. She's smart. There, I just said it. She went to a fine school. I went to Western Carolina University, which people used to tell me, you know, they'd ask me, where do you go to school? And I'd say, Harvard. And they'd look at me and say, really? i say, oh, no, no, it's Harvard's mountain campus in western North Carolina. It's called Western Carolina University. See, they're studying alcoholism there. It's, very, it's a very deep research project they've been doing for 20 years. <clears throat> it's a joke. So Timothy Wilson, UVA psychologist, in his book, Strangers to Ourselves, listen to this, remarks that only about 5% of what we do in a given day is the outcome of our conscious, deliberate choices. I mean, you hear that and you're like, I don't know, I can't, I can't possibly believe that. Only 5% of what I do in a given day is the outcome of a conscious, deliberate choice. Well, what, where does the other 95% of what I do in my day come from? Ready? Habit. And it's so ingrained in who you are that you don't even think about it. You thought about it six years ago when you made that habit. But now it's so automatic that it's become part of your subconscious. It's become what Aristotle deemed second nature. It's just so automatic to you that you don't even think about it. But here's the thing. That habit has so formed who you are that you can't even recognize it anymore. And at some point, you made a choice to do that. And what I want to say to you this morning is, wake up for just a moment, evaluate it, and make a choice as to whether you're going to continue it. Because it doesn't only inform who you are, it's helping you become what you're becoming. 
hate what is evil and hold fast to what is good. Let's read chapter 12, verse 14 again, and I want you to think about a person that this verse may be referring to. Somebody who might have exemplified this type of behavior. Someone you might be familiar with. Chapter 12, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Paul says, that's, that's what I want for you. But see, if, if your role model is, is, uh, is a politician who can't possibly bless someone who persecutes them, who only curses those who curse them, how are you ever going to get there? But if, if every day, instead of starting your day with a world and culture that comes from that box in your living room that curses those who curse them, what if you got up next to Almighty God? through the person of Jesus Christ? What if you started your day with fellowship with a God who, while he's hanging on a shameful Roman cross, says, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. That sounds like blessing to me. While, while everyone around him is saying, if you're God, save yourself. If you're the king of the Jews, then come down off of that cross. As the curses fly, he returns blessing to a world that doesn't even understand that they're crucifying God. And, and that's the same God that wants to whisper in your ear every single day. Amen. All right, let's pray. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. There's nothing more good, God, than what you've done in the person and work of Jesus Christ. There's nothing more good than your love for us that you, that you cast towards us while we were yet enemies. While we were cursing you, you released blessing. From a cross you said, Father, forgive them. And, and, and you have released your forgiveness upon us, O oh God of grace and glory. And Lord, I pray that somebody this morning who's hearing this would become more intentional with what they're allowing to invade their hearts and, and make a choice to meditate on your goodness and grace in their lives more than they meditate on evil. And I pray you'd release all sorts of blessing as a result. Amen.